Hello again, and continuing the series on books about World War II Special Operations. And we come to uh, an autobiography by one of the agents. And I read this book many, many years ago uh, when I was still at school. I endured it then, and it's still a really uh, good book on the subject. It's uh, this book. Knights of the Floating Silk by George Langelong. Uh, straight away, it's one of the best titles for a book on the subject, I, th I think, ever. Um, George was um, uh, French and British, and he was living in France, and he escaped uh, back to the UK during Dunkirk. And he um, went to Sandhurst and trained to be an officer. It's all in the book in, in quite a lot of detail. During that time, he had a couple of meetings with a Colonel Gielgud. Uh, this was Lewis Gielgud, who was uh, one of the two recruiting officers for F section of SOE. He was actually the brother of the actor John Gielgud. So, uh, the book doesn't actually mention SOE, but it does mention working for um, Major Bookmaster. Uh, so it, it obviously was um, F section of SOE that he was working for. Now, one of the things that he goes into detail on is his training. So as soon as he's recruited, uh, a couple of weeks later, he's sent up to Scotland to uh, train up in the paramilitary schools and this is where um, there's quite a problematic part of the book to me and I've written about this on the forum in some detail and re never really had a an answer no one's ever really explained um, the problem is that the people he describes as being the close combat instructors there are totally unlike any that actually existed in SOE. Now, I previously uh, mentioned in the um, paramilitary book uh, that we reviewed uh, uh, SOE in Scotland, they did an extract from Knights of the Floating Silk and it mentions uh, training with a Japanese uh, close combat instructor. Well, I've never seen any other reference to a Japanese being on the staff of the uh, training schools. And I, I looked into um, the wartime experience of the leading judo, Japanese judo people in the UK, such as uh, Gunji Koizumi, and uh, it wasn't them. Um, so I think that is something that needs to be explained. But then the other instructor he talks about is the Shanghai Buster. And his description of him is lithe in or well, it says another of our instructors was a superb brute who had once belonged to the shanghai police force and whom we had promptly nicknamed shanghai buster lithe in spite of his short thick neck and his broad muscular shoulders he seemed smaller than he really was with his long arms and slight stoop that gave him the aspect of a monkey having learned to walk like a man his thick black curly hair his broken nose, his flashing white teeth that no amount of punching had ever loosened, a long scar from ear to chin that seemed to pull up his mouth when he grinned would have got him a job at any day in Hollywood. That doesn't describe either Fairbairn or Sykes physically. Uh, Fairbairn did apparently have a broken nose but he didn't have thick black curly hair and physically he, he, he wasn't like a monkey. Neither was Sykes. They've both always been described as being rather schoolmasterly. They both wore spectacles. They were both about 57 years of age at this time. And to the young recruits, that was quite old. Um, back then, you know, sort of people died in the 60s. And um, it, it just physically um, doesn't line up with them. He continues, off duty, his conversation was limited to two words, yes and no. Now, other people 
have said Fairbairn was a talker. And um, this quote, Off Duty is, is Conversation Limited, has been um, reproduced in several other works. So it's become, a, it's become um, attributed to Fairbairn, and there doesn't seem to be any fact in that. Uh, One morning as we trotted out on the lawn, we had found him hanging upside down from the branch of a tree. So, again, this doesn't sound like anything that Fairbairn did. Uh, it, goes, it goes on to talk about the training and, and, and so on, and all sorts of things about how to um, board a train at speed and things like this, which, again, no one else has ever mentioned about the syllabus. Now, to a lot of people who are interested in history, this seems like a minor point, but to those of us who are interested in the specific history of close quarter combat, it is quite an important point because uh, it's, it's hard to understand where this misinformation came from. Was it an editor? Um, what, was it something just lost in translation? Also, there's um, quite a lot to um, to um, kind of question about the dates because at the time that uh, Mr. Langalan was going through training at Arisaig, Fairben and Sykes were heavily involved at Loch Aylort. Now it's not impossible that they came over, uh, I do understand that, but they had only just really started in the July of 1940, that's when they started um, they actually joined the forces and then went to um, Loch Aylott. So it doesn't give a lot of time for um, Mr Langland to have trained with them. It's not impossible but it's another point and uh, as I say to me it's a mystery. Uh, Mr Langland did operate, he parachuted into France uh, he, he had a, a good record. Uh, he, he was a very brave man, and I, I'm not uh, in in this series of um, reviews. I'm not out to debunk or to critique. It's really about books that I've enjoyed and I think uh, deserve reading, uh, which includes this book, except for this one part of it. And it's not really um, a criticism as such as more um, I would like more information it's a search for uh, elucidation and I've actually um, corresponded with uh, quite a noted historian about the, the instructors and the close quarter combat and he couldn't really shed any light and in fact most of the, um, the serious historians know less about this subject than the serious researchers uh, who've written articles on the forum and so on. Uh, after the war, um, Mr. Langlam became a fairly noted writer. He wrote the book, The Fly, which is made into a film about four times. Um, so he, he had quite a career. And uh, as I say, I enjoyed the book. I've got this old copy. It was uh, published in, in 1959, um, at a time when interest in the wartime exploits of the special operations was very high, but the actual amount of information officially released was very, very low. So these books sort of fill that, that kind of gap. And if anybody out there can add anything to the mystery, um, the email's in the link under this and please get in touch.